Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show, and today I am here with Emily Tyndall, who is a candidate for... Uh, District 11 in the Oklahoma State House here in Oklahoma. How are you doing today? Doing very well, thank you. Welcome. Um, so first question I have here is, how has the campaign changed since the pandemic started? Yeah, so for us, um, the pandemic's immediate results were we had to stop knocking doors. Uh, in light of that, we got volunteers to, from their own homes, we sent them packets and they, they sent mail out to people in the district and we just kept updating our, our database. Um, we kept trying to communicate as best we could. We moved to a heavy digital campaign. So we started doing a lot more on our social media, um, including virtual town halls, which we've gotten pretty good success with those recently as the pandemics continued. Um, last week we had up to 35 people watching at one time. And it's already had over a thousand views since. So we're definitely getting more traction um, online now that people are kind of settling into the pandemic. So moving forward, it'll be a lot of contactless literature drops. It'll be um, phone conversations, trying to work with like Zoom meetings as far as meeting individuals. Anytime I do in-person meetings like I did this morning, um, I, we sat six feet apart inside because we had to be inside because it was raining. And we, we both had masks on and, and didn't touch each other at all. Didn't change. So it's, it's shifted quite a bit of how traditional campaigning and best practices work. But we're trying to work with it and still be safe. All right. That's good. Um, what specific things are you emphasizing in terms of policy for your campaign? Yeah. So our platform has remained relatively the same since we started. Um, of course, public education is one of the biggest things that we're, we're standing behind, making sure that, especially as we've got the COVID crisis going on and teacher safety, that we are continuing to listen to teachers. Um, they are the ones literally on the ground with students every day. And so when we create education policy and budgets, we need to make sure that we're keeping those key stakeholders, shareholders involved in the conversation. Um, other than that, other than public education, we've got healthcare access that's more salient than ever at this point. And that includes maternal outcomes, mental health care access, really trying to look at this from a holistic standpoint about how Oklahomans can access care. There's about 600,000 Oklahomans that don't have or that have mental health issues. And we know that there's a dearth of mental health resources in most areas of the state, even up here in Bartlesville, which is um, a relatively socially progressive, if you will, community that, that really works on advocacy and resources, it's still hard to find mental health um, resources up here. Aside from that, we've also got economic recovery, economic growth on the platform. A lot of that has to do with how we invest money in the state. Therefore, it's kind of indirect. Um, the, the measures we take with education and healthcare actually build economic recovery especially when we're looking to attract new businesses from out of state, um, such as losing out to Tesla, um, which that's a whole conversation about Elon Musk. And that's <laughs> beside the point. Um, but after, after getting into um, kind of seeing the way that the U.S. is responding to George Floyd's death, uh, we decided to go ahead and add a criminal justice reform platform or plank to our platform. Um, it wasn't something that we highlighted especially much before, but given the need for it in Oklahoma, where you've got, you know, we incarcerate people for 70 to 70% as long, um, again, as other states do, especially in our region, um, it's, and of course, with the um, socioeconomic and racial disparity with our 
criminal justice system, something we have to work on. Um, that's been a really neat uh, tool and a neat platform point because a lot of ministries up here in Bartlesville are actually working with women in recovery or men in recovery trying to help keep people stable. And so what I'm trying to find now are the intersections with what private groups and charities are doing and what they need from state infrastructure so we can maximize what they're doing in the community. That's All kind right. of where we're at. Yeah. All right. That's good. Um, and could you tell me about your opponent that you're going to be having? Since last time we I talked to you, it was... I want to say sometime earlier this year, uh, you've had a change of who the uh, your opponent's going to be. Could you tell me about who that is? Yes. So I'll kind of give a, a, the, the short story. And for the most part, I let my opponent speak for themselves. Um, I don't believe in giving name recognition. Um, but yeah, so what happened was I thought for months I was going to be running against the incumbent Daryl Center of House District 11. He's a freshman, had done a lot of work on virtual charter schools, education and such, conservative Republican, but, you know, the capital leadership could work with him. He did cross party lines to get things done. So he was well, well respected and liked overall, as far as I can tell. I thought we'd have this kind of collaborative competition. I'd be running as the Democrat. I wouldn't win. But at the same time, we'd still be making a stand for democracy and democratic elections. Like, you know, I believe every every election should always have at least two people in it so that we can have choice and have discussions. Um, and what happened was on April 10th, the last day of filing, he picked up a, a far right conservative opponent. And I, I won't even say conservative because he's conservative. This is an extremist um, who really just uses state issues or no, I'm sorry, federal issues rather than state issues. To, to create a narrative for the district um, that doesn't resonate with the district, that doesn't represent what's at stake in our state. It might impact a few people. It might, you might find some common ground with a few voters, um, but overall it's not gonna push our state forward. And so at 4 p.m. on April 10th, which the deadline is 5 p.m. on April 10th, I, I was refreshing the page every hour, um, the state page and her name popped up. And so that really changed the the tone of the election. We were end up ended up kind of just in a holding pattern until the primary. We were still working, still fundraising, still working hard. But as far as tactics and strategy, we didn't. I mean, you go two different ways completely depending on the the winner. And she ended up pulling out a victory, uh, which I think had a lot to do with suppressed turnout from COVID. She ended up beating the incumbent. So the education community has been mourning the loss of one of their big education advocates. And I have some big shoes to fill in that capacity for sure, because he had direct experience working with the education community prior to being the state representative. Um, so now what we're doing is really trying to build a bipartisan coalition because we know that my opponent's federal points, the hyper-partisanship, in the right tone for, for moving our state and our district forward. Um, we know that right now it's investment in our state, but prioritizing reform um, in the state, in the criminal justice system for agencies. We, we see the disasters with ODSC um, and how people aren't able to get their unemployment um, payment. I, I don't believe that her narrative is one that's ready to take on those challenges. But I do think that we have been engaged in the community, putting down roots in community structures and really trying to understand the issues in the district and how the legislative level can achieve some results for the, for the district. All right. That's cool. Um, how did you feel about the passage of State Question 802 earlier this last month? Yeah, I'm very happy about that. I know the big question is how are we going to pay for it? And I have my own, you know, I have my own reservations. I understand a lot of where um, the conservative narrative was coming from about tying our con our state constitution to federal oversight. I understand that. But at the same time, seeing that federal minimum wage hasn't increased in 10 years, that technically our standards for federal poverty level are too low. I'm not concerned that we're going to that the federal level is going to start upping things too much too soon, um, because I see them as insufficient as it as it stands. So I understand the concern. Um, I think that in practice and in function, we're not going to see that come to pass like um, like OCPA and many other conservatives were concerned about. 
And the hard part is, you know, it might not be the optimal function. It might not be the optimal mechanism for passing Medicaid expansion, but we desperately need Medicaid expansion. We've had 10 years and the legislature didn't do anything. The supermajority only became more entrenched in the last 10 years. I mean, I was there paging the day, pretty sure the day that they um, refused to expand Medicaid in the state and opted out. Um, and it was just very much this chip on our shoulder that it's a democratic policy, even though the Affordable Care Act had originally been created by the Heritage Foundation. It was a Republican policy point from the 1990s that got put into law by Democrats in 2010, 2009, 2010, and then conservatives were up and armed against it. And so I'm very glad 802 passed. I understand some of the talking points against it, but overall it's high time we have it. Now the question is going to be revenue and funding it. And honestly, that's a tricky spot to be because revenue conversations are hard. Nobody wants to talk about raising taxes. Nobody wants to talk about how we appropriate funds. And you look at the budget and you're like, well, what are we going to do? Everything is so tight as it is. It's like when my husband and I were first married and I was making $1,500 a month as an eye care tech, even less than that actually after taxes. Um, at one point, we were just living on what I was making, and it wasn't sufficient for both of us in Manhattan, Kansas, where there, the rent is higher than the Tulsa area. And you're just like, what are we going to do? There, there's nothing gives. And that's what the Oklahoma budget feels like right now. And so, of course, the answer for us was, all right, James, it's time for you to get a job so you can increase our revenue as a family. And I think that's what we have to look at as a state is understanding that at some point you can't cut anymore. Um, the answer is then, all right, how do we build revenue in a way that supports state investment and actually helps the economy that's not just kind of this arbitrary passage of taxes and isn't an arbitrary cut of the budget? That's my long answer about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, and how do you feel about how the pandemic is being handled by local officials in the towns within your district? And how do you feel about how the governor is handling it? So I think I have a bit of a unique response. Maybe it's not unique, but at least I'm trying to be very careful. I advise to be careful about getting into a city. Um, understanding that, honestly, the people operating at the city level, for the most part, have been in doing this for a long time and are aware of the constraints on them. Um, now, of course, there's the political question, and because the pandemic has been so politicized, there are questions of political expedience. Um, I wish that our cities would pass mask mandates because we have had pretty significant issues in Washington County, in Bartlesville, with COVID cases, although a lot of those early on were linked to um, some senior homes, which um, there were a good 40 deaths, I think. Not 40. There were a bunch of cases at one point. I'm sorry. I don't think there were that many deaths in, in Washington County. Um, but there were some significant issues early on. At one point, they had done like a partial closure. Collinsville had kind of done the same um, back in the early days of the pandemic. I don't know that a forced shutdown is the way to go because what we've seen is with masks mitigating spread, we can successfully keep the economy open while still mitigating spread. And that's the whole idea is that you can kind of open back up to some amount of normality with the exception of things like bars and movie theaters, which should not be open regardless of masks. Um, simply because that's too much contact and too much spread. But because it's become politicized, these heavily, these very conservative areas are not going to move unless forced. And that's what kind of forces the issue of state versus local, in my opinion. And with Stitt being honestly too politically afraid to take any significant action to protect Oklahomans, we're continuing to see cases rise because we have a patchwork um, a patchwork strategy that just isn't isn't working. Um, people are just continuing to get sick. And what we're going to see from that is continued economic consequences, continued um, pandemic consequences, as we just can't get it under control um, because we refuse to take action. I, I like local control. I believe in local control. But in a public health crisis, you have to have some kind of unified policy and that takes social and political guts. And, and right now, we're not seeing that kind of leadership. And that's extremely disappointing. All right. Uh, well, that's all the questions I have here. Uh, oh. Thank you for coming on. Where can uh, we find you on social media? And what's your campaign website?
Yeah, so the campaign website is emilyforoklahoma.com. And as a reminder, my first name is spelled E-M-I-L-I-E, not a Y. And so when you Google Emily for Oklahoma, make sure you've got the I-E in there instead of the Y. We're on Facebook as Emily Tyndall for HD11, for House District 11. Or you can search Emily for OK. Um, same on Twitter. Twitter handle is Emily for OK. And Instagram is Emily for Oklahoma. Um, you'll obviously I've got shorter hair now because I buzzed it all off for the quarantine. That was the other big change was the quarantine haircut. Um, but the profile picture is always like the pixie haircut, so it it should be pretty consistent across those. I'm also on LinkedIn, so connect with me on LinkedIn. I know that that's not used as much for campaigning, but I like it for the the social and political networking aspect. So I'm on there too. All right, thank you. Thank you.